Hello, CIV friends and family. Can you believe it has been almost an entire year where our whole world basically shut down? And for the first time, we were not able to gather as a community to celebrate Easter, Christmas, birthdays, and many more. And through it all, we would continuously hear that this is our new normal. Yeah, 2020 will be remembered as a year of many challenges. However, 2020 will also be remembered as a year of many opportunities and new adventures. Throughout 2020, we were able to gather food and deliver it to the Edmonton Food Bank. Also, while things were closing and shutting down, a new group was being planted in a multi-housing area, birth that of CIV. And as online services began, for the first time, our audience was no longer limited to one building, to one time, to one audience. Through it all, God allowed for our worship gatherings to reach people beyond Edmonton. And because of this, there has been hundreds of people over the year that were able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So these are a few things the Lord has allowed us to experience in the midst of a pandemic. And we want to say thank you, dear friends and family of CIV, for your continuous giving and support to the ministry. Although we do not know what tomorrow holds, we definitely know who holds it. May God continue to bless you as you continue to give faithfully and cheerfully to the Lord through Church in the Valley. Good afternoon, good morning. Hello to all CIV friends and family. Thank you for joining us once again here in person and also online. I hope that everyone has had a blessed week enjoying the beautiful weather that we have been blessed with. And I hope that, you know, it's going to be an awesome day. Thank you for joining us once again in worship. Let's all stand together and put our hands together and worship the Lord.
22 verse 37 to 39. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself.
Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your promise that you are never going to let us go. That, Lord, no matter what comes into our lives, where there may be be storms and chaos, Lord, but you are our anchor, that you never let us go, that you hold us through it all, and you are with us. And we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for the week that we have had. We thank you, Lord, that you were with us every single day, and for each blessing, for the ups and the downs. We thank you, Father God, because through it all, we get to claim that God is good, that God never left our side, and that God is here. And we just pray Father, because we know we worship the living, true God. And we thank you, Lord God, that as we continue in these weeks to come to prepare um, Easter Sunday to remember the promise that you have fulfilled through your Son, we thank you, Lord God, that we have hope, that, Lord, you are our hope. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray this in your name. us in worship today. And thank you, Isabel, for uh, lending your creative talents to our worship as well. I want to say also thank you to our behind-the-scenes guys here today that make this all happen. This is a lot of work, and it's not like we're all professionals. In fact, the majority of us here are all volunteers, but uh, by God's grace, they're using their talents, their gifts, and they're just getting better at what they're doing. So thank you, uh, guys, for, for doing that. Uh, so, we are in a series of messages looking at relationships, and you can go ahead and hit play there, Dyer. And um, we've been looking at our relationships over the past couple of weeks, and we've been using uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 as kind of the template for relationships, and specifically Christian relationships, and even more specifically, the, the relationships within the household. And uh, we began talking about the husband and the wife. We talked about how important it is to, to the family that the husband and wife uh, you know, be unified in their relationship. I spoke to the men a few weeks ago. Dindin spoke to the women last week. And now we're going to jump into Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. And I've entitled today's message, Fighting Families. Now initially, I wanted to do kind of a sibling rivalry message. 
I was going to talk about, you know, your relationship with your siblings. Because your relationship with your siblings, if you have a sibling, can also determine you know, how your character is shaped. How you treat each other within the home become the reflection of how you would, would treat the world around you. When you learn how to resolve problems within the home, then you're able to resolve problems better outside of the home. Make sense? It's important that in this day and age, we understand, you know, the dynamics of, of a family and how we are, you know, intended to work together as a family. Uh, it's been said, here's a study that's been shown. You go to the next slide there. Aaron, it says, sustainable societies, sustainable societies depend upon strong families. So in other words, as the family goes, so does the country. So does the nation. When we look at just the incredible disunity within our world today, it can go back to the family. When the family is broken, we begin to see that it ripples all across our communities, our cities, and even our country. So sustainable societies, as this article says, depend upon strong families. Nations that seek to remain economically and politically vital must reproduce themselves. Listen to this. Children are most likely to thrive socially, emotionally, and economically when they enjoy the shelter and stability of an intact married family. Marriage is most beneficial for children when both parents are positively invested in their lives. Kind of like what we saw in that video where the father was, was engaged with the children, right? And families, it says, are most likely to flourish when they can be built upon strong economic foundations. The family is important. It was God's design from the very beginning that we would be a part of a family. There is no one here today that isn't part of a family. You were born into a family. Now maybe it's not the family that you wanted. Maybe it's not the family that you desired. Or maybe perhaps you've experienced you know, even being orphaned as a child. But it's still God's desire and God's plan for the family to be a representation of the fellowship that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have. So today, as we look at Ephesians chapter 6, 1 to 4, I hope you guys are taking notes because this is really good. I, I enjoyed doing this and uh, this message and preparing for it. And it also reminded me of just again the need for this kind of message in our day and age. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, it begins with these words, children. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Remember, he just spoke to the men, he just spoke to the women. Now he turns his attention to the children. Now, how many of you here are children? <laughs> you should all be putting up your hands, okay? We all have parents, a mother and a father. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Okay, before you tune me out, just wait, okay? I'm going to unpack all of this. All right, it's not just about you kids, you know, being obedient to your parents. I'll unpack that, okay? So don't tune me out just yet. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, all of these passages, you have to remember, fall uh, after some key passages in Ephesians. Children are to be the parents, but parents, specifically it says in this passage, Father, again, we'll unpack that in a moment, explains how we're supposed to not provoke our children to anger. But again, we have to go back to Ephesians chapter 5, 18 and 21, because that sets the context for chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul reminds them of this key phrase. It says, be filled with the Spirit. That's Ephesians chapter 5, 18. When you're filled with the Spirit, then you're going to do the things of the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, then you're going to reflect Christ-likeness. And then he goes on, and, and then towards the end of that, that passage there in verse 21, it says, okay, all of this, um, God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
Here, the Apostle Paul reminds us that it's a mutual submission. We talked about this a few weeks ago, where we are to, as husbands and wives, mutually submit to one another, demonstrate a, a common care for one another. And likewise, children are incorporated in this as well, that we too are to mutually submit to one another, and that parents are supposed to mutually submit. And it's in the context of this mutual submission that we begin to flourish as a family. Remember Andy Stanley, if you've been tracking along with our uh, marriage seminars, reminded us that it's about a submission competition. It's about who can out-submit the other person. It's not about us submitting the other person, putting them in a headlock, and making them submit to our will. But it's how we can, like Jesus, serve one another. How can we outserve one another in our family and by doing so demonstrate Christ's likeness? And the reality is so many families, and maybe you, you grew up in this kind of home and you've experienced this, but in so many families there's just so much complication. We love families, don't we? I mean, families bring joy. They can also bring so much pain. Joy and pain. Sunshine and rain. Pump, 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 pump it up. And I think it's possible for us to believe that Christ can transform the world over before how uh, even families. That God can take what's broken. God can take what's, what was never intended to be and restore it. Uh, but in our mind, in our limited thinking, we think God can never change this. God can never intervene in this moment. I want to encourage you today and say, yes, he can. God can take the most broken families and bring redemption and restoration. How many of us believe that Christ can change our families? How many of us can believe that, that Christ can change the world we live in? How many of us believe here today that our families can be used to be that change? Christians, imagine this. Christians living as Christians. Starting in our home. Man, it's so easy for us to want to travel the world and share the good news and the gospel with every tribe, tongue, and nation. But we have to be reminded that our first ministry and first mission field is our home. That's why the Apostle Paul talks to Timothy and says, if you want to be a leader of the church, you first must be a leader of your own home. You must first take care of what's in front of you. How, how dare you try to lead God's people if you can't even lead your home? And so here we are in this passage. And we're reminded of two things, one for children, one for parents. Number one, Christian children are to love God by honoring their parents. And secondly, Christian parents are to love God by discipling their children. You see, it always boils down to us reciprocating our love back to God. So in the family and within the home, how do we do that? How do we you know, love God in this passage, as it says, by honoring our parents. How do we love God as parents by discipling our children? Well, let's look at number one. Children love God by honoring their parents. Going back to verse one, it says children. And I highlighted some key words there. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And so again, the Apostle Paul is going back to Exodus. You know, when the first Ten Commandments were given to the people uh, of Israel. And he was explaining to them that parents uh, and children are to work together. Uh, children, obey your parents. So what does this mean? The key word again in verse 1 is obey. To obey means to both hear and respond to the hearing. The, the idea of someone hearing a knock on a door and going to listen to the one who knocks, that's what it means to, to obey. You're hearing and you're also doing. You're not just hearing it and allowing it to go the other ear, but you're taking what you've heard and you're doing it, children. Now, before we, we jump into and point fingers at the children in this room, I said, as I said earlier, we are all considered children. In fact, when Moses gave his commandment to the people of Israel, he was most likely talking to those who were second generation and who would be, you know, essentially burying their parents, right? The first generation who came out of Egypt with them, and because of their disobedience, there's that word again, disobedience, they were not allowed to enter the promised land. So for 40 years, they wandered around the desert. Could you imagine 
suffering for the disobedience of someone else's choice. Alexa's like, that was not my choice. That's not my fault. And yet Moses was instructing you guys to still love, obey, and honor our parents. Man, I, I struggle with that sometimes. A lot of times actually because I'm prideful. Because I think that I can do all things by myself. But I fail to acknowledge that without my parents I would not be here first and foremost. And as I remind myself of all the good things that my parents have done for me, I realize, man, there's really no reason why I should dishonor them. In fact, I should honor them. And so today, mom and dad, I do honor you. And I do thank you for raising me, for rearing me up in a Christian home. And for giving me all the privileges and opportunities uh, that I had growing up. So thank you. But the reality is, <laughs> obedience is not easy. Obedience isn't easy. It's, it's an interruption to our lives, to our regular scheduled lives. It means we must do something. It means that, that sometimes we're, we're going to be asked to do something that we don't want to do. Please throw the garbage. Can you wash the dishes? Can you guys clean your room? How is it that a lot of these commandments are all centered around chores? <laughs> and what is your typical response when your parents ask you to do something? I'll... I'll do it later. I'll get to it. Here's a trick, parents. This is one of, the, one of the things I learned. Because when we want something done, essentially, we're saying we want it done now. And that's what the kids are hearing. And they're saying, well, it's an inconvenience for us because I got other things I'm doing right now. So one of the tricks is simply this. Give them a timeline. Hey, I would like you to throw the garbage before whatever. Put timelines on this. That way you're working together. Again, it's a picture of respect within the home. Obey your parents in the Lord. Now there's the other key passage. The only way that we can obey is to do it in the power and strength of God. You know, kids, once you've reached a stage or a season in life where you're able to comprehend and understand the words of God, then you are accountable for the words of God. As you grow in your faith, it doesn't matter if you have certain, you know, responsibilities in life, like, you know, for example, voting privileges or driving a car. Uh, those are all landmarks in life. But as a child who now is able to understand and discern the word of God, you have a responsibility to respond to those words as well. And so obedience is a requirement in order for us to grow, but we do so in the Lord. We do it as if we're doing it for God. We are serving each other in the home as if we are serving Jesus himself. It means this also. Obedience, as we see in this passage. Christian children obey because in doing so, they're obeying God, their true father. Now this is really truly remarkable. God gives Christian a uh, child in every home a way to live out their Christian life. As you begin in your Christian life to reflect Christ like amongst your siblings, amongst your parents, what you're doing is you're practicing obedience unto God. And the more you're able to do that in the home, you're able to reflect that in the world around you. The world around us right now, because of sin, because of the fall of man, is in chaos. And the world isn't looking for people to contribute to the chaos. They're looking for people that will contribute to the creation. Now, here's the other side of things. You're thinking, do I obey everything? What if it's contrary to God? What if it's contrary to Christ's command? Well, that's another aspect of that phrase. It says, in the Lord. If your parents ask you to disobey Christ, you must say no to them. That's a hard statement. Especially as we try to follow Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I remember the story of my mom growing up. She loved the church so much. Uh, she was trained to be a deaconess, a junior deaconess in the church. And she got into a little bit of an argument with my grandfather. And uh, as they were going back and forth, my mom said, I want to go to the church. I want to serve the church. And my grandfather said to her, Sigina, go ahead. Then you can sleep there. So what do you think my mom did? 
Knowing her compliant personality, she took her blanket and her bag and she intended to sleep at the church. Now my grandfather went after her as she tells the story and they were able to make amends. But isn't it interesting? And again, you have to understand that these commandments are given to Christians within the Christian home. So we are expecting that our parents will give us Christian advice, Christian um, examples. Th that's, that's part of this, the context of this passage. So Paul, again, is speaking to Christian families here, and he's encouraging within the Christian family that we obey, that we reflect uh, that love relationship with God. Um, God's mission for children is to trust and obey their parents because ultimately it's a reflection of trust and obedience to God. Can I say that again? Children, um, we must trust and obey our parents because it is a reflection of trust and obedience to God. So Paul goes on to say obedience is right. Why is it right? Well, no matter where you go in the world, obedience to parents is the norm, but it is right for a Christian in a different way. It's right for a Christian because it is connected to the Old Testament commandment, which says, honor your mother. You'll notice it's in quotation marks. Honor your father and mother. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20 and 12, it says that you might live long in the land. There is the basic structure of a good life that God has established from the beginning. In this dynamic, in this relationship with uh, our parents, we are demonstrating good stewardship of our relationship and it will help us in our relationship outside of the home. So, again, just to remind ourselves, I don't know what's going on with the screen there, but Christian children love God by honoring their parents. Good job, guys. Thank you. Let's move on. Your obedience to parents, as I said earlier, is training for obedience to Christ. And if you can't obey Christ, you will not have a good life. And again, that's applicable to Christians. So how do we honor our parents? Let me give you three practical ways you can honor your parents. Number one, we treat our parents with the proper value and weight that they deserve. You cannot treat them as if they don't matter. You can't just simply close the door and ignore them. Recognize that they are significant. Recognize and value them, first and foremost, as those who have been created in the image of God, and secondly, those who have been entrusted to care for you. Tell your parents that they matter to God and that they matter to you. Even though they may not reciprocate that love, you're still called and commanded to reciprocate love and care for them. When something good happens for children, man, most parents are filled with pride and joy. You know, last week, uh, Karis was going for her road test, and uh, I didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't actually drop her off at the, I was waiting for her at the testing place, and she was texting me back and forth, I am so nervous, I am so nervous for Karis. Uh, I don't know, is she prepared, is she ready for this? And she was just so nervous. And I was at home, I was in meetings, and uh, I would just text back and forth, Karis got this, she knows what she's doing. And you know, we back and forth, and, and then man, we were uh, watching Karis do her road test, and then it's like, she's going too fast, slow down Karis. And then 15 minutes later, Dinda texts me and she says, she's done. And then silence. And I was at home waiting for the answer. No response. They were going to withhold the answer from me. But I finally called her and said, what's going on? And she said, she failed. And I said, liar. <laughs> and she said, she passed. She passed. She passed. And man, there's a sense of joy in, our, in parents' voices and lives when we see the accomplishment of our children. Uh, you know, when our children text us, their, their grades at school. You know, it's not all about grades, but we also want to honor their accomplishments. We want to you know, acknowledge that they're doing a great job. And just as parents are filled with joy and pride, children also be filled with joy and pride for your parents. Don't be embarrassed about your parents. Don't be embarrassed about who they are or what they do. 
Just acknowledge that they have value and weight. Secondly, here's a big one. We forgive them. Parents are human. They're also sin sinners, just like you and me. So imperfect. I know you view your parents, I know my children do, and they think that we can do no wrong. <laughs> they think we're perfect. And then they realize how flawed we are. But we are called to forgive our parents. Jesus doesn't call us to do easy things. It's not easy to simply forgive our parents, especially if our parents are no longer with us. But we can still forgive them in our heart because it still shapes in us the ability uh, to, to build proper character and relationships in our lives. Jesus wants to free you from bitterness. He wants to free you from anger and resentment. Jesus wants you to live a life that is full of forgiveness. Will you let him? And third, you can simply free yourself and your parents uh, and your parents from your need for their approval. Now this is a big one. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can be 5, 15, or 50, and there's still a desire for approval from your parents. There's something that is shaped in you as a child that longs for the nurture and the care of a parent. When a child is just but a baby, he goes to the mom and dad and raises his or her hands and wants that response from the parents. Uh, when, when they learn how to walk, you say, wow, good job. And when they have accomplishments in their lives, we want to applaud them for it. But what if you never get the applause of your parents? What if you never get the approval? What if you never hear from them, good job, well done? Or what if you've never heard from your mother or your father, I love you? Well, first and foremost, you let that go. You free yourself from the need for approval and you acknowledge and realize that you have been approved by God. That you have been approved by God. You can let go of your need for their approval because all the approval you long for, everything that you need, all, all approval for eternity is yours in Jesus Christ. Amen? It doesn't mean that you don't long for your parents, but it means that you are made whole in Christ. Jesus, uh, the words of the Father to Jesus says, My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Do you know what the Gospel says? The gospel says that you have been adopted by our Heavenly Father. That you have been accepted. You've been approved. And those words are your words for you. You are God's beloved child. And He is very pleased with you. Can you see how freeing that is, guys? That as you go through life, you no longer need the approval. You no longer need to try and live up to a standard that was never intended to be there. I know it can be hard, but a Christian child loves and demonstrates that love to God by honoring their parents. Christ can redeem everything. Let's not limit that. Now let's turn our attention to the parents, shall we? Um, Christian parents, number two, Christian parents are to love God by disciplining their children. Just make sure you're paying attention. It actually says discipling. <laughs> make sure you're paying attention now. True Christian parents love God by discipling their children. Going to verse 4 of Ephesians, it says, Fathers, and here's the other thing, okay, guys, understand that it's not just a reference to, to me or to, to the men, but back then, 2,000 years ago, the, the father of the home was head overall. I mean, whatever he said went. In other words, he could take the children, he could actually sell them into slavery if he wanted to, because he had the, the power and the authority within the home. And so when the Apostle Paul was talking to the church in Ephesus, this was countercultural, right? This was not the norm, but he was addressing not just the fathers, but the mothers, especially now in our day and age. It's parents. So we can say, parents, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. This is all about discipleship. We have been given the first responsibility to disciple our children. It would be a shame if we spent all of our time and our attention trying to save the world 
when we've neglected our relationships within the home, God calls parents to disciple their children. That's where it happens. It's not the church's responsibility to disciple the children. It's not the church's responsibility to try and, you know, raise them up. It's the church's responsibility to come alongside the families, the parents, the children, to resource them and encourage them so that they become all that Jesus has intended them for to be. You can't make your children Christians. One of the greatest desires I have, not just as a pastor, but as a father, as a parent, is that my children would embrace Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and that they would live that out to the fullness of their life. They can accomplish so many great things in this world, whether it become a doctor or a lawyer, all those things are, are awesome, or even if they're called to be a pastor, sure. But if they do not have the love of Christ in them, especially if they're a pastor, then I have failed as a father. Because I want them more than anything to experience Jesus Christ. But I can't make them. I can't make them a believer. I can't make them follow Jesus Christ. But my responsibility is to create an environment within the home that makes Jesus more attractive. Amen? Amen. And yet so many times, there you go, buddy. So many times we're, you know, as Christians, creating a hostile environment within our home. Where there's so much anger, where there's so much argument, where there's so much bitterness. We're not reflecting the, the joy of the Lord in our home. That's why our responsibility as parents is to create the environment. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Now that word train up, it's not the choo -choo 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 train. It's, it's an agricultural term that the author uses here to explain how a, a plant is being raised. How you're supposed to train the plant. You're supposed to you know, support it when it's growing. Without that support in place, then it can be susceptible to other dangers. It could fall over if the wind came. Right? You notice these, these saplings that are planted and they have the bars that help them to grow straight up? Because the reality is the, the flower, the plant, will always grow in the direction of its influence, where the sun is coming from. If the sun is coming from this direction, it'll grow in that direction. The sun is coming here, I'll grow in that direction. The sun is coming here, it'll grow in that direction. It's the same idea that you will be, whatever influences you will in, infect you. You will move towards that influence. If you're spending an exorbitant amount of time on social media watching things you shouldn't be watching, then that's going to influence you. If you're spending time with friends who are just always down in the dumps, who are toxic, guess what's going to happen to you? But you say, oh no, Pastor, I want to be a good influence on them. Well, it's been said that you are the sum of the five friends that you have in your life, right? The, the five people you spend your, your time with. And yet so many teenagers, when they go home, they just close the door behind them and don't even engage their family. They're so disconnected. And likewise, with the fathers and the mothers, they come home from a busy day of work and they're exhausted. All they want to do is just put their feet up and watch TV and ignore all the problems of life. And we neglect the importance of the home. We are to nurture, train up, a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Is that a suggestion or a promise? That's one of the 5,000 plus promises in Scripture. That when we raise, and raise our children in an environment, the seeds that have been planted there will return back. That's our prayer for our children. That's our prayer for all of you here in this room. A family, a Christian family, that is sold out for Christ and His cause. God has so much more in store for your family than just a humdrum life of work, rest, and entertainment. He wants to lead you on this adventure. You'll remember if parents in Scripture, um, if parents can be too hard, what happens? In 1 Samuel chapter 20, we have the story of Saul and uh, you remember the story of how David was coming up a young handsome uh, you know musician and not only a young handsome musician but also a warrior and people were singing the praises of David Saul has slain his thousands but David is tens of thousands and you can see the jealousy and the rage and envy begin to emerge in the life of Saul 
right? And there was a hole where they were sitting, having a feast, having a dinner, and then David, Saul, Saul was looking for David because he wanted to kill David, right? And so he turns to Jonathan, his son, and says, Where's David? Where's your friend? How come he's not here? And Jonathan knew the heart of his father. And he said, well, I don't know where he is. And Saul was so angry at his own son. He said, don't you know that this guy is going to steal what is yours? The kingdom, the inheritance, the crown? And Jonathan could care less of those things. For even as a young man, he knew what was right or was wrong. But his father was so full of anger and rage that his own father took a spear and thrust it at Jonathan, his only son. Man. And in 1 Samuel chapter 20, Jonathan, it says that Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger. Fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to anger. I think so many times we can be hard on our children. We can be demanding to the point where we break their spirit. We break their hearts. The point is it's easy to provoke our children to anger. We don't have to be evil King Saul, but we can also provoke our anger amongst our children by being too soft. Can you give me an example in scripture of someone that was too soft? I want to use the example of Jacob and Joseph. In Genesis chapter 37, we see the failures of Jacob as a father. What was it? He showed favoritism, right? He showed favoritism to his, his son because he was born of the woman he loved. He was too soft on Joseph. Joseph had these outrageous dreams and he was telling his older brother, this is, good. This is how it's going to happen. One day I'm going to be ruling over you and you're going to bow down to me. Now how would you feel as an older sibling if your younger sibling told that to you? <laughs> you would probably laugh and you know, just kind of smack them on the head and say, yeah, right. And yet all throughout the scripture we see how the sibling rivalry plays out, right? How the firstborn and the secondborn are always at odds, or even how the twins, you know, Jacob and Esau were at odds. And we see how that even plays out even in the New Testament with the sibling who's going to be the greater one. There's something to be said about sibling rivalry. If you ever grew up with siblings in your home, you, you, you realize that, that there's something actually healthy about a rivalry. There could be something healthy about you know, people competing back and forth. I think we live in a day and age where we try and uh, elevate mediocrity, where we try and celebrate everyone for whatever level they're at. And so we, instead of seeing them rise to greatness, we just keep them where they're at. Like, good job. Way to go. C plus. Good job. I mean, I mean if you're a C plus student like me, that's, that's okay. <laughs> but we always want to see them reach their fullest potential. And I think within the, the family unit, the siblings, you know, going back and forth demonstrate that rivalry, that challenge, that competition that helps us to become better. But if there's anger and rage within our hearts, that competition can turn to danger to the point where Joseph was almost killed. If not for his brother intervening, his step, his half-brother intervening and saying, let's just sell him off. That's even better, isn't it? to be sold off into slavery. But we can see how even being soft to our children, demonstrating favoritism, demonstrating unfairness within the home can lead towards disruption and destruction and ultimately anger. As Christian parents, um, we are to see our children not as annoyances, not as an emotional crutch, but we are to see and understand that they are a gift from God and that we are to steward that gift. We are to be responsible for that relationship. We are to bring up kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That last phrase is so important. This responsibility 
of discipling our children is such a strong responsibility. Notice those last words, of the Lord. We are to, as Christian parents, instruct them in the Lord. What does this mean for us Christian parents? That means we must be intentional. We must be aware of the rhythms of life. We have to understand how our week is structured so that we can build that into our home. Let me ask you this question. How much of a priority is Jesus in your family? Now, I remember growing up, my parents over our kitchen table would have a little placard that says, Jesus is the unseen guest at every meal. So as we're sitting there eating, that was supposed to be a reminder to us to be on our best behavior. Jesus is watching you. Behave, huh? But more so than that, I think the reminder is this. That because Jesus is in our home, He is the center of our lives. And you remember that triangle diagram where the husband and wife are focused on each other with God on the top and the husband and wife on the bottom. If the husband and wife are just focused on each other, they find that they butt heads. But as they focus their relationship first and foremost with Jesus, they actually see that their relationship goes closer with one another. And the encouragement is the same thing for us as parents and children, that when we nurture our relationship with God, we actually grow closer as a family. How much of a priority is Jesus in your life? Is this church an important part of your life? Coming to church, being a part of a fellowship. I know we've done a lot of online worship in the last year. But even in your home, are you gathering together, engaging with uh, the songs and the text, and worshiping Jesus together? It doesn't even have to be on a Sunday or a Saturday. It's just that you're doing it together. And as you do it together, you're going to want to long to do it with others as well. Is Jesus a priority. Reading the Word of God together, praying with one another. We try to build that into our home. Of course, at every meal, <laughs> we pray. Lord, thank you for this food in Jesus' name. Amen. But uh, as we drive the kids to school in the morning, we give each other responsibilities. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is someone's responsibility to pray for the day, to pray for each other. We try to do things together as a family. I was just telling Dindin today that 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago, we, we sat down and we, we made some decisions about the future, knowing that our children would be this age in life. They would be going through these things in life. Myself and Dindin would be going through various experiences at this stage in life. What were the changes that we had to make then? so we could be successful today. It goes by so fast. But one of the things we said is we have to be intentional, intentional, intentional about raising our children. We have this window of opportunity parents where we have our children for this period of time. God has given us the ability to choose. And more so than that, He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not easy. It's not easy when you're living together because the reality is if you do life with anyone for any period of time, you will step on each other's toes. You will annoy each other. You will bother each other. Every little thing can just cause you to just be more and more divided. Especially in this pandemic where we're around each other so it seems 24-7. And we can just annoy each other. Or we can use this window of opportunity to grow closer with each other. I'm, I'm thankful for this pandemic because it's caused our family to have more meals together, a lot more meals together. It's caused our family to pray more together, to laugh together, and hopefully grow in our faith together. So parents, take this time Love God by discipling your children. Karis got her license. She's looking at universities. Some of them are not even in our country. 
that window's getting smaller and smaller. But I believe that as we've trained them up in the Lord, it will not come back to us void. Guys, the reality is families, Christian families, are under attack today. The enemy, Satan, hates you. And he hates your family. The psalmist says that children are to be like arrows that are thrusted into the heart of the enemy. The enemy hates you. And he will do everything to try and destroy and destroy and destruct your life. He is not your friend. John chapter 10, 10 says there is an enemy who looks to kill, steal, and destroy. But the great promise is that Jesus has come, the good shepherd, to give us life, to give it abundantly. As families, we cannot be fighting anymore. We are not fighting families. We're not facing inwardly fighting each other. But we are fighting together, hand in hand, back to back, saying, I got your back. I got your back, mom. I got your back, dad. I got your back, bro. I got your back, sis. We got each other's back as a family. We are fighting families. We're fighting the enemy. Show the last picture there. <laughs> we can be used by God to see change. First, it begins in our hearts. And I want to challenge any of you here today that if you've never given your life to Jesus in, in a real, tangible, vibrant way, you can do that today. And that as He comes into your life, He begins to shape you from within it. He begins to heal the brokenness, wounds that you may have had from previous families, relationships. And He desires that you would have a strong family. He would desire that you would experience the joy of the Lord in your homes. For those of you here today, you might be listening online and thinking, you know, what, how do I do this? How do I become a God-fearing family? Well, our job as, as a church, again, is to resource you. We'd love to recommend resources, websites, but the first thing you can do together as a family is begin to pray together. So in your homes, if you're with your family, would you hold the hand of your family? And just come together in prayer. As we wrap up, would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you again for this timely message. The reminder, God, that you've given us a family. And that as the head of our family, God, you've already demonstrated all and complete love by giving us your son, Jesus. There's nothing we lack. There's nothing we need. And so God, I pray that today we would allow Jesus to redeem our families. That God, you would restore brokenness where there's brokenness. God, you would bring healing to those who are so hurt. God, I pray for those today who are listening and they're saying that they've never given their life to Jesus and today they're saying, I want to do that. Lord, I pray that they would take that step towards you and they would pray this prayer, God, I need you. God, I'm far from you. I am broken, I am hurt, I need you. Would you come into my life? God, you can do that. Oh God, you can do that. Lord, you can do that. God, we believe in miracles. God, we believe that you can move the mountains. God, we believe that you can restore that which is seemingly um, unrestorable. Lord, may it begin in us. May it begin in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you again for joining us in worship today. And uh, we want you to know that we are praying for our families. We believe so much in our families. But also know that if you need prayer, or just a phone call away or a message away, please reach out and connect with us. And uh, know that uh, we, we love you so very much. Um, also, uh, we are coming to the end of uh, the four sessions of uh, What Happy Couples Know. And it's not too late to jump on board. It's always online. And I tell you, uh, I've been going through it with my wife. And it's just such an encouragement. It is uh, so practical. And um, next week, Din Din and I are going to circle back with you and kind of recap that together. Uh, next Saturday, we have a guest speaker who'll be joining us, so you don't want to miss it. Uh, David Ong from our seminary will be joining us. And so we're gonna, we're gonna just have a great time with, with Pastor David next Saturday. Uh, and as Christelle said earlier, in a few weeks, we will be celebrating Easter. And I tell you here in Edmonton, the snow is melting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never know, man. Like, we might be able to do an outdoor Easter Fuck service you. or something. Um, it's just, again, a beautiful, beautiful time uh, as we see spring emerging. We just want to bless you. Uh, have a great week. And again, stay connected with us in whatever way you can. All right, God bless.